Good morning. <clears throat> I used to be guilty of believing that faraway places were more interesting. Then, 10 years ago, I began to explore the history of a place I'd known all my life. When it all came together, I discovered that what had happened at Lake Pogama Singh, or Pog as we call it, was really a microcosm of the opening of the Canadian wilderness over the past century and a half. I will share with you some of the highlights and how I came to discover them, as that was the fun part. But first, let me show you where the lake is located. If you travel 400 kilometers north of Toronto, you arrive at the city of Sudbury, which is on the eastern edge of the Spanish River watershed. Pog is found in the middle of the watershed, halfway between Sudbury and Biscotazine, alongside the Spanish River and the CPR. Just north of Pog, the Spanish River splits into two, the east branch coming from Duke Lake and the west branch from Lake Biscotazine. This strategic location made Pog the, hug of, the hub of the upper Spanish, especially in a world when waterways were the only way to travel. Because of its proximity to the river, Pogamasing is now part of the Spanish River Provincial Park. Before I got serious about researching, I'd already had a good start. My grandfather, W.B. Plant, operated a lumber company during the 1930s at Y, a stop on the CPR and a stone throw from Pog. After the operation closed in 1940, he converted a former logging camp on Pog to a family camp where I've spent most of my summers since then. During the 1970s, I ran canoe trips in the area and I got to know the Spanish River watershed. In, intrigued with what I saw of the former logging structures on those trips, I sat down with my uncle, Bill Plant, my grandfather's walking boss of his bush operations, and asked him to explain what I'd been, been seeing and to share his stories. I might note uh, of those four, all those four structures that you see there, including that massive bridge over the Spanish River, are no longer there. All, if you go there, all you will find is some piles of rotten sawdust. That's what happens to time over 70 or 80 years, other, other than those steel uh, bars on the dam, of course. Before a lumberman, there were aboriginals, and there was no doubt that they had lived at Pog because my mother had seen this photo in 1929, and there was a native cemetery on the lake. Chris Hank's archaeological study of the Spanish River included more evidence that aboriginals had lived in Pog. These stone tools and arrowheads, a burial bundle, and five graves in the cemetery. He also reported that there had been a Hudson's Bay post in the lake in the on the lake in the 1880s, probably on the island where my mother had seen the photo. So who were these natives? This biography of Grey Owl by Donald Smith answered my question. When Archie Bellaney returned to Canada after World War I, he led the life of a troubled man in Biscotazing. There he met Alex and Annie Espanol, who became such trusted friends that Bellaney described Alex as a man I am proud to call my adopted father. The crucial information for me was to learn that Alex was the son of Louis Espanol, the manager of the Hudson's Bay Post on Pog. So how was I to find out more about him? Naturally, I googled his name and was astounded to find out that Espanol had been the subject of a paper delivered at the Rupert's Land Symposium at Oxford University the previous year. A trip to the Hudson Bay Archives in Winnipeg revealed a more complex, a complete picture of Louis Espanol and a description of the Lake Huron district of the Hudson Bay Company. Before I talk about Espanol's role in the fur trade, I should deal with the origin of his name as it's directly linked to the Spanish River and two towns in the area. His daughter, Jane Espanol McKee, wrote that her family descended from a Spanish trader she identified as Emmanuel, who came from Spanish America to the north shore of Georgian Bay. He married into an Anishinaabe band and became a chief. His son also became a chief, and because he fought for the British in the War of 1812, he was awarded two George III medals. This was the man who the Hudson's Bay clerks called the Spaniard or Espanol, possibly because they couldn't spell or pronounce his native name, and it was easier to give him the nickname associated with the Spanish heritage. The same clerks then called the river where the Spaniard and the family camp the Spanish River. When Espanol's youngest son, the man who was the subject of the Oxford paper, began to work for Hudson Bay, he was known as Sakakijik. However, he adopted the European tradition of using a given name, Louis, with a family name, Espanol. 
Now the Hudson Bay part. The Lake Huron District was formed after the amalgamation of the Hudson's Bay and Northwest Companies in 1821. The former Northwest Post of La Cloche became the headquarters of the new Hudson Bay District. The first factor, John McBean, created this map, which is the first acknowledgement of Pogamasing. Surprisingly, it is not by this name, but rather Pimgoshkoshing. However, the, how the name got changed is a mystery. After several decades of unstable fur returns caused by increasing competition, the arrival of Roderick McKenzie as the new chief trader at La Cloche in 1866 brought about an important initiative. Since most of the Hudson Bay posts were on the major waterways, it was easy for his competitors to intercept his hunters. McKenzie's solution was to establish four new inland posts to make it easier for the natives to trade with him. One of his new posts was on Lake Pogamasing. As I suggested earlier, the primary reason for choosing Pog was its central location in the Upper Spanish. There's likely a secondary factor. It was also the hunting ground of Louis Espanol, now an employee of Hudson Bay. It was a natural fit, the right location with the right man. The Pogamasing Post operated for 20 years under Espanol from 1869 until 1888. He was a remarkable manager who received positive reviews from his district bosses. However, a few were bothered by his constant demand for a higher salary, no doubt because he was paid less than white managers. Surprisingly, he always re received the raises because the supervisors realized if they didn't give it to him, he could become a daunting competitor. One of their attempts was to weaken his, one of their, uh, their attempts to weaken his demands was to see if his account balance with the company was in arrears. It never was, because he always kept a surplus. In fact, Espanol had lent $300 a year salary for him to another manager. With weather and competitors to deal with, Hudson Bay could always adjust and carry on. But one factor they could not cope with was progress. In 1880, the federal government approved the building of, of the Transcontinental Railway to the Pacific. Although the railway was initially not planned to be constructed in the Spanish River Valley, this is exactly what happened. You can see on the map how the rail line cuts through the heart of the Lake Huron District. Espanol's realization that the railway would be a threat to his people's way of life altered his priority from post manager to band chief. When the railway construction reached the area in August of 1884, he wrote to Indian Affairs in Ottawa requesting a reserve on Pogama Singh for his band of 100 or so people from three separate areas. The request was denied because two of the groups were members of the Spanish River and Whitefish Lake bands and already had a reserve under the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1840. The third group was turned down because they lived north of the Lake Huron watershed and did not yet have a treaty with the Crown. Uh, I should point out on Espanol's chest, you'll see those are the George III medals that his uh, father was awarded for the, his contribution to the War of 1812. But the worst was yet to come. <clears throat> Once the railway was constructed through the Pog area, it brought in white trappers. Since there were no provincial trapping regulations, anyone could trap where they pleased and damn the consequences for the aboriginals who self-regulated their own hunting grounds. By December of 1884, Espanol wrote a second letter to the government to plead for help. He wrote, all of my old Indians are in great need. The white trappers have stolen all of the beaver. Nothing was done to stop the intruders. A few elderly natives were treated by a Sudbury doctor. However, any food distributed to them was docked off their treating payments of the following year. 45 years later, Archie Bellini, now known to the world as Gray Owl, complained that transient white trappers were still destroying the fur resources of the country. Pogmasing Post was closed in 1888, and within a decade, only two posts in the district were operating, Biscotazing to replace Pog and Sudbury, but now for a very different market. The demise of the fur trade and the coming of the railway signaled a transition to a new economy in the area. Lumbermen had been chomping at the bit to get to the upper Spanish that the railway had opened up. But before a logger's axe could strike a tree, the government required, required an assessment of the resources. 
This assignment fell to the provincial land surveyors who were to assess its natural resource potential and measure it for timber limits and townships. Surveyors were a group I knew nothing about, but who really impressed me with her significant but little-known contribution. If you look at this 1955 map, you'll see horizontal and vertical lines that create six-mile squares that mark each township. I had no idea how those lines were created. If someone had suggested that they were meticulously cut through the bush, I would have thought they were crazy. Then I found Hume Proudfoot's split-line drawing of the first baseline survey to, survey to POG, and I realized these lines were cut through the bush. They had to be perfectly straight and measured with a 66-foot chain. You'll notice in the middle of that 66, or that straight line, you can see his measurements, starting almost at the Canadian Pacific Railway and ending up on the edge of, uh, of POG. This is one of 42 such diagrams he would have to do for the 42-mile uh, survey that he did. These lines had to be coordinated with previous surveys and eventually became whoops, <laughs> townships and timber limits. What astounded me was how these surveyors accomplished this challenging task in winter, as they only had dog sleds, toboggans, and snowshoes to travel. One of the surveyors of the Pogmissing area, Alexander Niven, described the kind of food they had to live on for four to five months they were in the bush. Our food was of the usual kind, flour, pork, beans, split teas, and tea, with a little sugar for the cook. We carried a muzzle-loading rifle and shot a caribou, caught a few fish through the ice, and shot about 76 partridges with a horse pistol. Their accommodation was just as basic, canvas tents, a couple of blankets spread on spruce boughs, and a fire between the tents. These guys make us all look like glampers. <laughs> Surveying was one of the areas of employment for Aboriginals, and they proved to be highly valuable for their bush skills, in particular, their unerring sense of direction and distance. For example, T.J. Patton would give his native guys instructions to meet him some 25 miles ahead of where the, of where the survey line would intersect with a river or lake. After he showed them the direction with his transit, they headed off, sometimes having a detour of many miles. When the survey party reached the agreed point, all the surveyor had to do was to fire his rifle, and within 20 minutes, they would arrive. On one occasion, his native scout was so close, they had to take his tent down, as it was dead center on the survey line. <laughs> Although logging was not to begin until the timber surveys were completed, Mother Nature intervened, or some think an arsonist, and a huge forest fire broke out in 1891 along the Pog Spanish CPR corridor. This forced the government to auction off the burnt timber or lose it to the almighty boar worm. There were many companies that logged on Pog, but there, it wasn't just in the timber agent books that I learned who they were. One of the other discoveries for me was to recognize these saw law markings, which are called timber stamps. As we paddled around the area, I found floating logs with different symbols. I was able to identify most of them with names I found in the agent books. Some were obvious, such as J.C. for John Charlton, but many, such as this 7-up stamp, were brain teasers. After the stamp owner was identified for me as John Colclaw from Saginaw, Michigan, I decided that since he was from Michigan, UP could mean Upper Peninsula, and 7 is the number of partners in the company. It was not what you are probably thinking. It had nothing to do with the drink. <laughs> By 1900, the, bent, the, the burnt timber was cut and the surveyed timber bursts were auctioned. The POG limits were logged by two companies until 1929 when my grandfather and his partner, Ed White, purchased the limit. Prior to this, their company, White & Plant, had been cutting pulp for the Spanish River Pulp and Paper Company further north around Duke Lake, the headwaters of the east branch of the Spanish. There was a lot of jack pine that didn't interest the pulp company, and since White and Plant were also in the railway tie business, they wanted to find a location down the river close to the CPR where they could set up a mill. This brought them to Y on the CPR, a mere 100 meters from the Spanish and a kilometer from Pog. The mill and the village were constructed during the first half of 1929, the worst time to be setting up a new operation. By the end of October, Canada and the world were in a severe economic depression and shortly afterwards, Ed White left the partnership. 
I could say a lot about my grandfather as he, as he had a commanding personality. Contrary to what we sometimes hear about lumber barons, my grandfather really cared about his employees. He provided medical care for the men and their families for a dollar a month, including their medicines. He profit shared with the log cutters. And for the mill workers, he canceled their company store debts at the end of every season, as he knew the wages at that time were instructed with, for men with large families. It was difficult to sell lumber during the Depression, but he kept the operation going, selling a bit here and there. The lumber that piled up over the years was sold once the war came, although the wartime profit regulation prevented him from making a windfall. Today we use the Bud Car, Via Rail's passenger service, to get to Sheehan, the new name for the former stop at Y. For years while waiting for it to arrive, I'd look at the field behind the station, where I knew the village had been, and wonder what it had looked like and what life was like there so many years ago. It wasn't until I found this photo of Y that I could actually envision the village with its bunkhouses, office, and family houses. Across the tracks and alongside the railway was the sawmill, although not as it looked in this colored photo. But how to find out about life in this former village? Luckily, I found a, a long-lost relative who had lived there. My grandmother's father, Joseph Hicks, worked as a harness repairman for my grandfather, and he and his wife lived in the village. When they learned that their daughter had separated from her husband, they suggested that she send her 12-year-old son, Jim, to Y for a year. He could attend school, help out with the chores, and work in the mill the following summer. She gladly accepted, as she was so desperate. We were just so damn poor, Jim told me. I would never have met Jim if Gail and Cy Tulk of Butcher's Camp hadn't told me that they'd received an inquiry from a relative by the name of Oliver. Recognizing the family name, I followed up and met Jim that fall. He was now in his 90s, but his, he had an amazingly clear and detailed memory of that year at Y, 75 years ago. Not only did he draw me a map of the village and sawmill, but he provided a rich portrayal of life in the community, now gone, that gave me what I was looking for. But the one lasting <clears throat> artifact which has outlasted all the buildings, equipment, and people is a 16-millimeter color film that my Uncle Bill took in 1939-40. It illustrates so vividly the complete lumber operation that, of that era, from cutting and skidding in the fall, hauling sleighs of pine logs by teams of horses to the frozen lakes in winter, driving logs down the flooded creeks in spring, and operating the sawmill in summer. I combined the movie with my uncle's interview that I taped in 1972. It's possible to see how lumbering was done and hear it described by a man who knew it well. If you're interested, you can see it from my website, which I'll provide at the end of the talk. The end of World War II initiated a new era for Lake Pogmasing, as many men and later their families wanted to get away to the wilderness to fish. Some built their own camps, and two fishing lodges, Pog Lodge and Butcher's Camps, were launched. Let me touch on three aspects that demonstrate what makes our lake distinctive. Family, fishing, and transportation. For our family, my grandfather began the transition of the former cookery to a family camp by bringing furnishings from the former village, such as bunk beds, box stoves, and kerosene lamps. Windows from the schoolhouse were installed to lighten up the gloomy interior. When I found this photo years ago, I couldn't understand why he built such a high fence around the camp. Was it to keep out marauding bears? However, this photo showed the real purpose, <laughs> to keep the kids away from the water. My grandfather called it the bullpen. What so many people found out later, my grandparents knew instinctively. Create a place for your family in the wilderness, and they will return. We are now into our fifth generation, numbering about 75, and only a few have left. This family priority is found in most other camps on the lake, as I'm sure it is for others, when they put down roots in a cabin or travel together on a canoe trip. That sense of fa family has expanded to a sense of community with others on the lake, and we are lucky that in a remote area, we can always count on each other. A second distinction for our lake has been its fishing. Pog has enjoyed a legendary reputation for lake trout. Sorry. Uh, Pog has enjoyed a, reputary, repu a legendary reputation for lake trout. The name Pog Missing may have been created by its original inhabitants because of it. 
For both the aboriginal logging periods, trout was an abundant and reliable source of food. A Y villager told me that they could always catch buckets of trout whenever they went out. Unfortunately, the lake trout numbers declined in the early 50s, either because of overfishing or from dropping the, the water levels in the fall, which froze the spawn. After bass was introduced, they soon became the dominant game fish. But the biggest fish story for our family was the day my father went bass fishing and came home with a 10-pound pickerel. Why was this so unusual? We didn't know there were pickerel in the lake. A few questions over at the landing brought smiles and an explanation. Last fall, the MNR announced it was considering lengthening the bass season in the northeastern part of the province. Well, uh, it hoped to reduce the trout predators and bring back this important native species to all the lakes that experienced a similar decline. Transportation to our camps is a major challenge given that there is no highway to the lake. A few fly in, but most of us take the bud car. You may remember Dave Hatfield's presentation of bud car winter camping and his song, Waiting for the Bud. It's now our theme song. At one time, once we arrived at Sheehan, it was load and unload several times until we arrived at camp. It was much like a canoe trip with, with people who didn't know how to pack. You can see from this map, we had to trek to the river, cross the Spanish, travel to the landing, and then take a three-kilometer boat ride to the camp. The major obstacle was the river, and it was a grueling task at times. A family friend suggested the perfect solution to our problem was an amphibious landing craft, like the one he commanded during the war. But where to get one? Then one day, 1959, my uncle spotted an ad for a duck in the globe, and no time was on its way to Sudbury. After some mechanical repairs, we headed out early one June morning to give it a test run up the Spanish River to Sheehan. Needless to say, adventure trumped caution. While driving to the river on a former winter logging road, two front springs broke and pierced the hull. No need to worry. The vehicle had excellent pumps, and we brought an, excellent, an extra pump for such an emergency. When we hit the river, two more challenges confronted us. The surging spring runoff especially in the Boulder Rapids, and rafts of pulp logs on their way to Espanola. <laughs> Surprisingly, we made steady progress, utilizing the six-wheel drive, winch, and propeller in different combinations and situations. However, in the afternoon of the second day, the duck engine flooded with water and it stopped dead just two miles from our destination. Later, the, my Uncle Bill's mechanic from his lumber operation resurrected the drowned duck and by the 1st of August, we had the answer to our transportation woes. It was now a 50-minute trip with only one loading at the station and another and one unloading at camp. There are numerous other stories I could tell you about. How in 1926, Pog was involved in airmail history. A couple of David and Goliath dam disputes. A prisoner of war camp that was established east of Sheehan. Why we have a dead horse bay on the lake and about a terrible tragedy that happened to a family of four. But the amazing discovery for me was to learn how the story of Pogma Singh in the area was a microcosm of what happened in the wider Canadian wilderness in the last 150 years. The area bore witness to so many of the key actors, aboriginals, fur traders, railway men, surveyors, loggers, mill workers and their families, and people like all of us here who love to get away to the wilderness. And if you're interested, there's the website for Pogamous Thing if you want to see the film. Thank you very much.